new guy, converted heart, and uh, I'm glad to have you guys this morning. It is either this world or heaven. It is either 
either hell or heaven, eternity with the Lord. There's a world out there that has tremendous light because Jesus has lit it up, but there's also a lot of darkness in this world, and that comes from the enemy himself. So we have to choose. Listen, folks, there are no alternatives. There are no gray areas. There are no other options. It's Jesus or the other. Let me tell you what John 3 said. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, remember this, whoever believes in him should not perish, but has eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to bring condemnation, damnation, destruction to us. But in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. And you know why? Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So you see, if you look at your life right now, before Jesus Christ and your decision to trust Jesus Christ, you are already condemned. There's a verdict of death upon you. We are all appointed to die. Sin has come into our lives, and that has separated us from God. We have a death penalty. So that choice to trust Jesus Christ and to understand the value of the gospel, which is his death, burial, and resurrection, when we understand that, Man, we gain so much. The shed blood of Christ washes away our sins and we're no longer condemned. I like that. Amen. Amen. Let me give you another but. Once we receive this glorious salvation of Jesus, we're still in these clay tents. You know what that means? Sickness is going to come. Amen, sister? Hey. Disease is going to hit us. Pain is going to be experienced. Failure and disappointment are going to come. Heartaches are going to happen. As long as I am in this clay tent and I am in this sin-cursed world, those things are just going to be a part of it. But let me tell you something. That's why I call this message broken vessels. You know why? Let me tell you why. Verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know what the treasure is? Look at verse 6. That God has shined the light of the face of the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts. You know how I go through cancer? With Jesus inside of me. You know, you know how I go through sickness? Jesus inside of me. You know how I go through heartache and pain and death? Jesus inside of me. I have a treasure inside of me that allows me to overcome everything that this piece of clay or this sinful world puts me through. And if Christ is inside of me, greater is he in me than he that's in the world or anything else in it. But I want you to remember the inside. See, we get so focused on the outward person. How I look, be honest, how I look, how others see me. We comb our hair, we put on our makeup, we cut our hair. Hey, we want to look good. I wear bow ties now because y'all just keep bragging on me. <laughs> but don't forget the inside. Now, I have up here something that I love so dearly. Uh, Aaron, come here. You can't figure out what this is. This is a Twinkie. And I love Twinkies. But I'm going to be a servant. Okay, come on over here. I'm going to be a servant. I want you to take a little bite out of it. Just a little bite. <laughs> is that pretty good? Yeah? You like that? I want you to take a bite of that and you take a bigger bite as you want. <laughs> Is that better? You know why? Look what's on the inside. Well, thank you, dear. Here, you can have this. <laughs> Don't forget what's on the inside. You know, people may look at us and they, they, they may 
cannot see what's on the inside. Because you know why? What's on the inside is not shown to them. It's not manifest to themselves. People put their just in one of them. This is what you see. So I have chocolate. But let me give you something. Chocolate's good. Amen? Amen. But wait till you get to the inside. You know what's on the inside? Take a bite. What's on the inside? Cherry. Yeah, and cherry and chocolate is good. I don't care what Deborah bought and said, it's good. <laughs> hey, just mine. Don't be mean. You think about it. Here's another thing. I, I'm getting just the things that I like. Vernon, come here. <laughs> Vernon, they made two choices, and there's only one choice left. Now, he's only doing this because he's a serpent, okay? Y'all know what this is? Yeah. I love bananas. So, Vernon, I want you. Yeah. Would you take a bite of the banana?
Gideon had an army. Remember how big Gideon's army was? 300. And he was up against another army that wanted to annihilate them of tens of thousands. How in the world were 300 going to defeat tens of thousands? Hey, God said, I got this. And you know how they did it? <laughs> they, they took pots and they put a, a little candle inside of it. And they raised those pots up at the midnight hour and they broke them and they saw all that light. They heard that noise and they shouted the name of God. And guess what 10,000s did? They ran like the chickens they were. God did. Not Gideon and not 300. God did. Remember that. It's important. Maybe he had in mind that occasion to where the Bible talks about God being the potter and we're the clay. And when we're broken, God has to take a little more mud and he has to start over and he puts it together and guess what? He makes the pot usable again. Maybe that's where he was talking about. I, I don't understand. Imagine what it would be like to be a useless pot. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Amen? You know what the Bible teaches us? But what good is that light? What good is that light if you can't see it? I'll clean it up. But sometimes, God has to break the pot in order for other people to see the light. Now I'm going to tell you something. We don't like to be broken. You know what I mean? We don't like to be broken. But God has to break us in order for other people to see the light inside of us. I prayed with three or four different people yesterday at Chicken Coop. All, every one of them went through cancer. And the one guy, what was his name, Jacob? Is it? Okay, he gave me your, your free refill on the pineapple. Her wife. Yeah. Going through cancer. You know what I prayed with you? Same thing I did the other three. That in the midst of their struggle and their hurt and their pain, that the light of Jesus Christ would shine clear. Sometimes, well, God breaks us in order for people to see the light and shine. We don't like to hurt, do we? But I tell you what, if we react to pain, if we react to disease, if we react to death, if we react to these things in the way that God has for us to react to them, guess what? Paul says it's not for us to be glorified. It's so that the power is in Him that He did it. I don't know if I should share this, but I'm, I'm going to Paul F. I was called over to Miss Hazel. Did she hear me back there? Called me early. Gail called me early one morning. Said Bob's not doing good. So I go over there and with Hazel playing in bed, having a hard time breathing. And I'd sit there for a couple of hours holding her hand. And uh, she'd ask me to pray with her and I waited till the end till I, I left. And the girls, Patty and uh, I just forgot, Betsy and Gail come and we just gathered around the bed and we prayed over her. And I, I went on to do other things, other business, actually. And I get a call in an hour, and Patty said, you're not going to believe this. And Mom got out of bed, went to the restroom, went to the kitchen, sat down, ate a bowl of soup. Got through, she said, I'm going to go sit in a chair. You know, it, she said, you're good. I said, no. It ain't me. It, it's the God I pray to. Let me tell you something. It's the God I pray to. All these things happen so that the glory goes back to the one whose face is shining inside of us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my goodness. Imagine that morning when we see him face to face. But now we're broken vessels. The pitcher, the light, is hidden till it's broken. The vase being broken is useless to the potter till he puts it back on the wheel and he puts it back together again. 
We have to be vessels broken from time to time to show everybody that the power is God and not us. Then we become usable vessels. But let me tell you what it's like being a usable vessel. This side of it. I'm not a father, so I can't put it back together that quick. But listen to me. Verse 8 and 9 says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. Understand that everything in this world is going to try its best to ruin us. But when we're broken, the potter puts us back together. To make us usable vessels. Even though God has deposited the very best in us, we're still a pot of clay. It's got to have repairs. Pam. It's got to hurt. Sister, it's got to. But guess what? When God does his thing, God shines himself in those situations. We're pressured, but we're not distressed. How many times did your plan just up and change, and you're like, oh my goodness, I am totally frustrated. Does that ever happen to you, Jim? Oh, it did. Just me all the time. Paul uses a word there for trouble. It's to lebo, a, a Greek word that speaks of that which by pressure or by affliction or by antagonism, it beats us to death. Guess what? Paul, in this moment, was surrounded on all sides by all these things. And when he was boxed in, you know what he did? He looked up. <laughs> Figure that. When he was boxed in and there was no place to turn, he looked up. And that's really where our gaze ought to be. Perplexed, but we're not desperate. You ever get to the point that you don't know where to turn? You ever been there? I bet you have. Are you shaking your head? It reminds me of a character in the Bible named Festus. What was he going to do with the man writing this letter? His name was Paul, and he was stirring a stink everywhere he was preaching. So Festus said, listen, here's the plan. If you'll do this, this, and this, then I'll do this. And guess what? Paul said, listen, Festus, I'm not a Jew. I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to a higher power. I want to go all the way to Caesar. Now here's Festus trying to figure out how in the world he's going to explain this to Nero. So what does he do? He turns to King Agrippa. He said, can you handle this? <laughs> King Agrippa knew all about the law. A whole lot more than Festus did. Now look at his life at that moment when he had no idea what to do with Paul. And that's where I've been. At the law. But I'm going to tell you something. Every time that I think I'm in despair, all I have to do is turn to Jesus and there's always hope. Always hope. Perplexed, never desperate. All these experiences bring us to a point of being at a loss, but we are not desperate. Because listen, my hope, and I hope your hope, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a sure anchor for my soul. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you anchored in? What are you anchored in? Persecuted but not disowned or forsaken. You ever felt like people turned their back on you? Well, I'll tell you somebody that won't. So there's a precious promise in the Word that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Say that with me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now say it this way. Jesus told me, Jesus told me. I am never, He will never leave me, never nor me. will He ever forsake me. <laughs> Listen, you can take that to the bank. If Jesus said it is true, it's always going to be true. We're, we're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. The Lord never leaves us. Never. Never. In the midst of cancer, in the midst of death, on the brink of hopelessness, never. Say that with me. Never. Bobby Ray, you missed it last week. That little pretty little girl beside you sitting back there. Every time I would get loud, she'd look at her baby doll and she'd say, he's getting awful loud. <laughs> I'm telling you, whatever you go through, if you've got Jesus Christ, never, never. There were three Hebrew children that got in a 
a fire. A fiery furnace it was. And, and went over. What was his name? Nebuchadnezzar? When Nebuchadnezzar went over there and he looked inside that, he was expecting those three boys to be burned up. But he got the surprise of his life. <laughs> In the midst of those flames, those three boys were walking around, and guess what? He turned to his soldiers, and he said, Haven't y'all fallen in there? Great. Well, what is it? One, two, three, four. Four? Who's the four? He said, That fourth guy, he, he kind of looks like the Son of God. Now, isn't that amazing that he would make that statement? He kind of looks like the Son of God. <laughs> y'all realize Jesus hadn't come in the flesh till later, don't you? Hey, that was a smart guy. Those boys came walking out of that fiery furnace and they went over there and they sniffed on them and there was no smell of smoke. There was no sin stare. Their clothes were just like they were when they stepped in there. You know why? He will never leave you or forsake you. Never. Elijah was up against the prophets of Baal and they did their thing over here, and I'll tell you, it was not successful. And he did his thing over here, and he knelt down and he prayed, and God took care of it, didn't he? You remember that? Yeah. Never, never. When the odds are against you, God never gives up. There was a boy named Buddy that was stricken with polio at the age of six and was supposed to die. That boy ran 70,000 miles, 100 miles in 15 hours and 2 minutes. Don't you tell me that God left me. God was right there with me all the time. Because I'm that buddy. What about God and you? What about God and you? I'm telling you, he's faithful. You need him. Prostrated but not defeated. Cast down. The Greek says slam to the ground on your face. This man right here, the Apostle Paul, he knew that. They slammed him down on his face in prison in Jerusalem. Then it was Philippi. Then it was Caesarea. Then it was Rome. And guess what? It was Rome again. Five times they slammed his face to the ground. And yet every time he walked out of that prison, you know why? God never left him or forsaken. Many times in our lives it seems that the devil has a stranglehold on us. But, let me tell you something. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and nobody. There ain't nobody. This is our, our candy. There ain't nobody that can pluck them out of my hand. Nobody. So here's the question. If you can trust Jesus with your eternal destiny, like the in the blank in this, you can trust Jesus with your eternal destiny. Then why in the world are you not trusting him for your purpose? Why? If I could trust a person like Bobby with a thousand dollars, why in the world couldn't I trust Bobby with pocket change? Huh? Folks, this world and what we go through, it is pocket change compared to heaven. This is nothing but pennies and dimes and nickels right here, folks. Can you imagine streets of gold? Can you imagine walls of jasper? Can you imagine gates of pearl? Can you imagine the river of life flowing through that city like Christmas? Mind has not seen or not heard what God has in store. Never, never will he break his promise. Paul had been gnashed by the teeth of Satan, knocked down over and over again, mobbed my life, but guess what? They could not knock him out. He was, he was the ultimate Rocky. We were talking about that the other night. You watch that Rocky movie some years ago. You get beat up like he was. If that was now, they would have called that fight a long time ago. And it went on and on. That was Paul. They knocked him down and knocked him down and knocked him down, but they never knocked him out. Satan could not kill him, nor could they. You know why? Because he was God. Broken vessel. And God kept putting him back together. Time and time again. And I'm going to tell you this. God does not lie. The Bible says he cannot lie. And if his promise is to never leave you in the if his promise is to Positive from the Spirit, the best of Him inside of you. Guess what? Nobody can ever tear that away. Nobody. And here's the secret. You ready? Two things. Number one, verse 10. 
want you to know the secret to this life of being a broken vessel. Number one is your attitude. You know, my doctor told my mom and dad he wasn't going to give God the credit when, when I went home from the hospital. He said, well, maybe he'll live, maybe he won't. He'll never want it. It's all about attitude. If my attitude is right, listen to me. Not my attitude. My attitude about Jesus. If my attitude about Jesus is right, indeed so. That's a secret piece of the puzzle. Paul says, I am always experiencing the death of Christ. You know what he means? You know what he means in that verse? He's not experiencing the death of Christ when he was in Philippi, not when he was in Corinth, not when he was in Jerusalem, not when he was at Rome. Every day he experienced the death of Jesus Christ. You know why? You know where Paul really lived? Not in Jerusalem. Let me tell you where he really lived. He lived in Calvary. You understand? He lived at Calvary. He never walked away from what Jesus did for him and what the power of the cross continued to do in his life. He lived at Calvary. When mobs came, when death was facing him, when it was sickness or illness, when the odds are impossible, let me tell you something. If you're living in Calvary, there's victory. Victory in the Lord, I say. He always cared about him, Jesus' death, a martyr for Jesus. What, not what he sought for, not even what he flinched at. It was the life that he chose to live. I'm going to tell you something, Mom. That's where we ought to be living. Ben Tapper used to say, we get so earthly minded.
you are much more precious to her than they would ever be. God, I pray right now that no one leaves this place today that has never received the deposit of the Lord Jesus Christ deep within them, the salvation of their soul, and what ought to radiate from every one of us that has received that deposit. The light is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if you have to crack us open as a pot, Lord, crack us open so the light shines that others can see and know that you're Jesus. Father, by your Holy Spirit, with the truth that we've tried so hard to present today, would you change the light? Would you draw us?